a homemade tracked wheelchair that I built for my sister about a year and a half ago. And now that it's been through the paces and it's been around long enough to be truly tested, I feel confident sharing it with you guys. Now, from conception of the idea to build this chair to completion was only six days, so there's really not a lot to these things if you have all the parts on hand. And all of the guts can be salvaged from a pre-existing wheelchair. And by guts, I mean the motors, the wiring, and the most important part, which is the controller. So I'll go over this kind of step by step, share how I built it, some important things to consider. And hopefully you guys can gain some inspiration from this project. This chassis would work great for things like personal off-road vehicles or even robotics. So on this channel, I've also got my larger gas-powered all-terrain vehicle that you guys might have seen. I call it the tank. And this was actually built before that even. So building this was actually instrumental in coming up with track designs. Okay, so I'm going to be going in about the same direction that I did on the tank video and start from the ground up. So starting with these tracks here, the tracks themselves are 5 inches wide and 88 inches in total long. When calculating your total track length, you want to make a unit comprised of one of your track sections here and the space in between it and the next one. So you'll be left with the space from here to here and you want to make sure that your total length is divisible by that, in which case I was using one inch increments. So one inch here, one inch space, one inch rubber, one inch space, one inch metal. Repeat. And so with these four inches, my total was divisible by four, of course, being 88 inches. So, so that's the way you have to do it to make sure that you'll have an even number of spaces. So in cutting the rubber track, what I chose to do, because I didn't need every single one of these one inch cross pieces to be made out of metal with these track stays on them, I decided to alternate between metal, rubber, metal, rubber, all the way around. And that'll also save on weight, cost, and the power required to move it, and a whole bunch of other factors. So the rubber itself is cut out to, like I said, a five inch by 88 inch band, essentially. And then three inch by three inch squares were cut out, leaving an inch in between each one. And in the center of each three inch by three inch square was placed a metal brace that's simply bolted on, as you can see, with nylock stop nuts, just to make sure it doesn't go anywhere, and washers to make sure that it doesn't dig into the rubber any more than it needs to. There are 22 of these plates in total at five inches wide. So there's 110 inches of one inch by eighth inch flat bar involved in the creation per track. And also welded onto those plates to keep the track in place is a one inch cut length of three inch channel. And the inside span of this channel fits perfectly over these tires that I'm using. And these are just bushing wheels, like something you'd find on a lawnmower. Now, I was able to find a whole bunch of the same tires, which is fortunate. So these down here are the bogies, and there is no suspension on this, just because it's not like it's gonna be doing any severe off-roading. It's really just made to go through soft mud, which of course offers a lot of cushion in and of itself. So after we have the track all put together, we need a way to move it, engage it, grip it, you know, turn it. So for that, we need a drive sprocket, and this is the one I created. So each sprocket has nine teeth, and a total outside diameter of 18 inches. So like I said, the track spacing is one inch, and so these are spaced accordingly. Now to get this circular ring, this is actually a small propane tank that I safely took apart, cut two inch wide sections out of, and then removed the necessary amount of material equally from each one to give it a circumference of an exact whole number in inches. Again, really? So the teeth are just made of one inch channel that was welded with the open side facing in and then ground down to a nice rounded shape because you can't have square teeth on a drive sprocket. What'll happen is, as it rounds this curve, the line is facing in a straight outward direction from the center of this out. What happens is, as it goes around this curve and it reaches the point over, and it reaches the breaking point over 90 degrees, it suddenly has a steep angle that catches the track. So to actually attach it to the motor, what I decided to do was, first obviously I made an attachment point in the center by using one inch by eighth inch flat bar, going from side to side to side to side, so that I could weld my shaft to the center. And to attach it to the motor itself, what I did is use some collars, not unlike this one, took two of them, welded them side by side, being sure of course to make the set screws line up. And of course these just need to be the inside diameter of the wheelchair motor shaft. And then once those were welded up, I simply made sure that the shaft was straight, welded in place, it's just a piece of half inch water pipe, which is then welded to there, centered, and this thing's been going strong for, like I said, about a year and a half, and I've had no issues with it. Just make sure to keep the set screws into the motor shaft nice and tight. And like I said, we're using the original guts from a spare wheelchair that was given to us a long time ago. It was way too large, and so we had no purpose for it. So of course I cannibalized it at the first opportunity to make this. The motors are oriented in the same direction that they would be, same side, same everything, in the old wheelchair, because wheelchairs have tank steering, which means steering is simply done by speeding up one side and slowing down the other, resulting in a turn either way. So after that, we need a way to tension the track to make sure it stays nice and tight and it doesn't skip any of the teeth on our drive sprocket. So what I decided to do was a very simple solution. I made this carrier for this wheel. It's simply a spring loaded with a trampoline spring and welded on with a hinge to give it a pivot point. And that presses the track in a good place 
right into the drive sprocket itself. And these are welded to the fenders, which are just bolted onto the main frame. These were added later, that's why they're not painted. But I found this to be absolutely necessary as you will notice that your track will stretch over time and it won't be as taut as you had originally planned. So these wheels are just set into this frame. They're kept from moving back and forth and rubbing by a simple collar that fits over these 5 8 inch bolts, which are smooth sided all the way to the other side, just to give the bushing surface as long of a life as possible. Now the way that I connected the track ends to make it into one continuous running piece was a lot different on this than it was on the full size track vehicle. Now I was lucky enough that when they dropped off the rock crusher conveyor belt from the quarry, the guys asked me of course what I was using it for, and so I explained to them and I took an interest up in the project, and they gave me a bucket full of these clamps. Now they're handy dandy little things with teeth on them, that are used for the same purpose on the rock crushers themselves as well as repairs. If they get a tear, they can simply use a whole bunch of these in a row. They're exactly one inch wide and they fit my purpose perfectly. They're two-sided pieces as you can see and they come with these special locking screws and nuts. And they even supplied a special tool that's used to put them together. And these aren't entirely necessary and they're kind of hard to come across. So if you don't have them, a simple hinge would do just as well, if not better, allowing a little bit more flexibility. Okay, so after the tracks, I think we'll go to the motors and everything is accessible just by removing this. So now we have a good view of our motors. And like I said, these are just the original wheelchair motors. And as you can imagine, moving tracks like this takes a lot of energy, a lot of force. And if you're questioning the abilities of these motors to do so, then remember these motors' purpose. This was uh, salvaged from a very large chair, very wide, meaning it was for a very large person with mobility issues. So these are capable of pushing a 350 pound person uphill with wheels that are larger than the drive sprockets I have, which of course, the smaller they are, the slower they are, and the more torque they offer. So those are just mounted to the frame by bolts and the way they were hooked up to the original chair with this one and a half inch by 3 16 inch flat bar, which is welded on the other side to parts of the frame. Now the frame is gonna be dependent on your design, but hopefully just the imagery alone will give you an idea of how I decided to build mine. So going over the frame, this is obviously one inch by two inch by eighth inch rectangular tubing. So each side has two of these angled pieces and then the in-between supports that connect each side and that other side, like I said, is identical to that and is connected both in the back there and in the front here on the bottom with two inch by two inch square tubing, which is the same material that comprises these uprights. And then from there, these are connected to each other with this two inch by two inch angle iron. You can see there and there and also there and there. And the cushion supports themselves, which also act as a brace, are made from one inch channel. One thing I'd like to mention while I'm right here is that these holes are for a seatbelt. It's not attached right now because it's having some maintenance done on it. But if you were to build one of these, seatbelts are very, very important. So these two pieces of two and a half inch by two inch angle iron function both as the battery box holders and also they run all the way out here to act as a very solid support for the footrest. These armrests are taken from the old chair. I simply made the top of the frame to accept the same spacing. And these are actually made with pegs that fit perfectly into three quarter inch water pipe. So I've got that there, 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 and there on every corner. And that fits in place and it won't go anywhere. The backrest itself is made out of one inch by one inch by eighth inch square tubing that I just bolted into the two inch by two inch square tubing that makes up the back of the frame. And then over that, this is just some camouflage vinyl material that my mom was kind enough to sew into a backrest. And there's a bit of cotton batting in there too to give it some comfort and some softness. This here is just an old honeycomb cushion that we had lying around that my mom was also kind enough to use the same material to create a cover for it. So we have a nice sort of camo military theme going on because it's a track chair, of course. This thing's like a baby panzer. Okay, so now I think you guys have a pretty decent understanding of how I made it in the inner workings. Like I said, there's really not much to it. You can see everything there is and get a good explanation in just a few minutes. So now I'm sure you guys want to see it move. So I'm going to wait for those batteries to charge. I'll throw them in, show you the wiring and how it's hooked up, and we'll go from there. So we're back about two hours later and our batteries are now charged. For batteries, I'm just using a couple of deep cycle 12 volt batteries wired in series to give us an output of 24 volts. The original chair had gel batteries, but unfortunately those are quite a bit more costly, but they're definitely a better option if you can afford it, as they're much safer and can offer a longer life. So our batteries are all strapped into place and held securely by these nylon straps. They're wired in series. You can see the actual power cord has a positive going to the positive side of this battery, a negative to the negative side of that battery, and then the positive of this and the negative of this are connected. And we're left with a 24 volt battery system. Now, something I added as a safety feature is an automotive fuse holder here. It's got a 30 amp fuse. Upon taking this to a friend's house who has an inductive ammeter, we were able to determine that a 30 amp fuse is the proper size. And we are completely together and ready to go. It's 
not fast, but it doesn't need to be. So this is my homemade track chair. I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. And like I said, this was made as an outdoor only chair for my sister. She doesn't have enough muscle strength to walk and she never will. So this was just something I could do for her to give her a little more outdoor mobility. This is one of my more constructive projects. So I hope you guys maybe take some inspiration from it. This thing didn't take that long to build. It wasn't that difficult. And for the amount of effort, I think the reward went a long ways. So I hope this maybe inspires you guys to use the skills that you've gained to help others, maybe just a little bit more. At the very least, I hope it gave you some ideas for some future projects. This track layout has worked great so far. It's relatively inexpensive, and it really doesn't take any special tools besides a welder to complete. I plan on doing a lot of mobility projects in the future. So if you're interested in seeing more of that, or if you just want to support the channel, then please, a subscription, a like, and a share would be greatly appreciated. And while you're here, maybe take a look at some of the other videos in my channel. I hope everyone watching was able to take at least something away from this project. So thank you guys so much for watching. Stay tuned for more.